you the co-founders of the South Asian Heart Center in Mountain View, Dr. Cesar Molina and Ashish Mathur. Dr. Molina is medical director of the South Asian Heart Center. He has a medical degree from Yale University and completed his medical, clinical pharmacology, and cardiology training at Stanford, where he was a Robert Wood Johnson scholar. In 1990, Dr. Molina established his cardiology practice at El Camino Hospital. Ashish Mathur is the executive director of the South Asian Heart Center and is actively involved in promoting awareness of this epidemic within the community. Prior to his work with the center, Ashish worked for over 25 years in the software industry. He's been a board member, entrepreneur, and an executive at many technology companies. Ashish holds a BS in Electrical Engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, and an MS in Computer Science from University of Southern California. Please help me in welcoming Mr. Mathur and Dr. Molina, who are going to discuss and further elucidate this apparent paradox. Thank you, Dr. St. Clair. Can you hear me? Okay, all right and um, members of the Google team who have been kind enough to have us here to talk about this issue. Uh, just before I get started, how many of you know about the South Asian Heart Center already? Okay, so few. And have you been to the program already? Or you, okay. Um, so, you know, I, uh, as uh, Dr. St. Clair introduced, uh, I'm not a medical doctor. Um, but I took part at El Camino Hospital to start this um, effort uh, because I suffered from a heart attack myself. And so since then, I've been looking for ways to prevent the second one. And uh, uh, as part of that search, we have been able to put together uh, this program as a nonprofit organization uh, at El Camino Hospital. <coughs> Okay, now how does this work? Oh, here we go, got it, thank you. Uh, so we'll talk uh, about um, the epidemic and uh, how severe this epidemic is in South Asians compared to other populations. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of what we do at the center and how you might be able to avail of our services there. Uh, Dr. Molina will then talk about therapeutic lifestyle changes, which is what our program is really based on, and he'll present to you kind of the evidence behind it. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about what you can do to help prevent a heart attack uh, and help um, uh, have better heart health. Uh, so one thing that I just wanted to point out was that South Asia uh, consists of the Indian subcontinent countries um, like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. Uh, it con constitutes about 17% of the world population. Uh, 2.5 million South Asians in the U.S., uh, and they carry 60% of the um, disease burden, uh, the global disease burden. Uh, what we see is that seemingly healthy, um, young South Asians present themselves um, with a MI or a heart attack uh, at early ages. 50% of the heart attacks occur before the age of 55 in this population and 25% of the heart attacks before the age of 40. At El Camino Hospital, where I'm at, when we started looking at this issue, um, while only 3% of the district population was South Asian, 6% of the cases that were reported in the emergency room with heart attacks were South Asian. Uh, we did a recent survey in 2009, and we found that 17% of the cases that were reported um, with MI, 41 out of 217 cases were South Asian. So that's a dispro disproportionately large amount of people suffering heart attacks. In the last three months, I personally know of three people within my family and friend circle that, that have had heart attacks, and one of them <coughs> passed away um, as well. And I hear this constantly. I'm called into emergency when a 35-year-old or a 30-year-old um, shows up with, a, with an MI and they don't know what happened, and they don't know why it happened to them. So we are um, looking at this very, very closely at the South Asian Heart Center. And some of the statistics around that are really so severe. Twice the amount of mortality compared to other populations when you have a heart attack, 
three times the chance of having a secondary heart attack, four times the risk of disease compared to general population, six times compared to the Chinese. And so the question always comes up, why is there this greater um, risk for heart disease? And there are really three um, reasons that we can talk about. The first one is that there is uh, early onset of the traditional risk factors, and this has been shown by multiple studies, um, the, the most famous one of them being interheart. And Dr. Molina will take you through some of the numbers corresponding to that. Uh, diabetes and um, um, cholesterol levels. The second one is the shortage of protective risk factors. Again, a thing that interheart study pointed out. Uh, that we have a vegetarian population that is not vegetable eating, but grain eating. Um, no fruits and vegetables in the diet, and a very sedentary lifestyle. And the third aspect is the genetic predisposition. There are many other risk markers and factors that are typically not looked at uh, that present themselves in the South Asian population. So the South Asian Heart Center was formed with the mission to reduce uh, this high incidence of heart disease through a program that raises awareness, um, that through a program that actually prevents um, by evaluating risks of different people and then facilitating lifestyle changes um, where, and, and coaching them through it. So we are at El Camino Hospital, which is right here at Mountain View. Uh, and it is really the first program that was started in the Silicon Valley to address this need. Our program has some guiding principles. We usually, uh, uh, we call our participants, participants not patients. We are preventing them from becoming heart patients. And it's really a three-way collaboration between you, the participant, us, the South Asian Heart Center, and your physician. We are not a medical facility. We do not provide any medications. Uh, you have to work with your doctor on that. But we work collaboratively with your doctor on that, and we work on the lifestyle aspects that can really dramatically change your profile, specifically as it relates to nutrition, uh, the coaching that we do to help you on your exercise programs, and stress management. So um, we have created a methodology which is more comprehensive than you might find at your physician's office, um, which consists of a very detailed heart health risk assessment, uh, followed by a physical exam, a laboratory test that includes the lipid panel, which you might get at a physician's office, but also some of the genetic factors that we have started looking at and some of the risk markers that are emerging uh, as part of the um, risk factors for this disease. Uh, and we are also introducing now um, the ability to actually detect the disease. You know, we can find risk factors, but it would be really nice to know whether you have the disease or not, and then you can start working more aggressively on managing it. So once we are done with the assessments, we identify your level of risk, uh, and then we start working with you on lifestyle changes. And we do that through a series of consultations. All of these are actually provided to you, all the consultations at no cost at the center. Uh, we go over um, the, the risks, and that's a consultation. We create a plan with you. Uh, we do a nutrition consultation, and maybe one or more, depending on how much need that you have. Um, we do an exercise consultation and we do a stress management consultation uh, to kind of tell you the total picture and how you can benefit by getting on to those uh, lifestyle changes. I'm sorry, it, uh, this child is actually going to be covered by Dr. Molina, so I'm going to skip it. Um, but this is what our program looks like. So um, there are a series of um, consultations, like I told you. The only cost to the program is the blood test that we have to um, uh, get you to do first. And that has been subsidized for South Asian Heart Center participants so that it's only $73 out of pocket for you. Uh, the rest uh, of the cost is borne by insurance companies as well as the lab provider. And with that, I'm going to let Dr. Molina continue his talk. So uh, today we're talking about prevention of cardiovascular disease. Everything that we discussed here today represents the prevention of coronary artery disease. 
can be uh, also said about the prevention of cancer and the enhancement of longevity, as well as diabetes mellitus. Um, this is actually a, a very important uh, topic, uh, at least important to us, but I think it should be important to all of us because actually health is a, a vital principle of bliss. So we can have this and that, but if we don't have health, we actually have, uh, have nothing. Uh, you can actually go around the world, you can go around this country and look at these great medical centers. Many of their big buildings have names of, of individuals who have been very successful, who have ended up being patients there are no longer around, but their, uh, their name is sort of uh, graces uh, a building. So today we'll be talking about uh, Therapeutic Lifestyle Changes, TLC. This is a lifestyle methodology for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. Uh, this is actually a combination of our program, the South Asian Heart Center, as well as the American Heart Association. If you need to remember anything after this talk, please remember the number 12. If you were to take a quiz, the number 12 is actually a very important number because this is how much you can add or subtract to your life expectancy on the basis of how you live. You can actually live 12 years less, or you can enhance your longevity by 12 years, depending on how you live. And also, that brings up the point about how many nuts to eat. We'll be talking about nuts in a little while. 12 nuts, 12 years. You need a mnemonic for that one. So we are going to discuss the possible factors <coughs> responsible for the increased risk of cardiovascular disease among South Asians. We're going to discuss the risk factors and lifestyle associated with successful aging and longevity. We're going to review the American Heart Association and the South Asian Heart Center TLC program. We're going to define successful aging and the importance of daily regular routine. We're going to talk about dietary strategies for improving cardiovascular and overall health. We're going to discuss the role of fitness on health and longevity. We're going to define stress and stress reduction and its health implications, and we're supposed to do this in about uh, 40 minutes. So um, I hope uh, you can stay awake. So as she showed, uh, showed this slide, uh, this slide is actually um, an interesting slide because you ask yourself, well, why? Why do South Asians who are expected to have a lower incidence of cardiovascular disease? In this country, vegetarians tend to actually live longer than non-vegetarians. Um, but South Asians, many of them are lifelong vegetarians, do not have protective effect uh, from their vegetarian uh, lifestyle. And uh, there are actually, uh, these are sort of some of the reasons. Well, there is excess burden of conventional and metabolic risk factors. That is, when compared to the world population, looking at individuals uh, having a heart attack, that is, 15,000 individuals with a heart attack versus uh, 15,000 individuals without a heart attack, looking throughout the whole world, actually we see that the incidence of diabetes among South Asians is a little higher than that of the general you know, population. The, the ratio of LDL, bad cholesterol, to good cholesterol in South Asians uh, tends to be skewed, so there is actually a higher ratio of bad to good cholesterol among South Asians. And they tend to have an earlier onset of coronary artery disease by actually by six years. There's actually a shortage of protective behavioral factors. For example, uh, exercise tends not to be a prominent component of the South Asian lifestyle. Only 6% of South Asians uh, exercise versus 21% of the average population. They have a grain-based vegetarian diet that is a non-vegetable, non-fruit-containing diet. That is, the consumption of just one vegetable or fruit per day is 26% in South Asians versus 45% in the rest of the population. And they also have a lower alcohol consumption per week, 11, one drink per, uh, per week, 11% versus 27%. The other thing is that alcohol seems not to be protective among South Asians, and the, the, the reason is that it's thought that the way uh, South Asian drinks alcohol, there's more of a binge drinking rather than a regular daily drinking, and we know that excessive one in a, once in a while warrior, you know, weekend warrior drinker is associated with increased risk of bad things happening to you. You just have to hang around the emergency room on a Saturday morning and you realize that. And then there are also some unrecognized risk factors. Now, we call it unrecognized because they're usually not measured in the typical physician visit. So what are those? Well, there is actually abnormalities in impaired cholesterol transport. That is, there are abnormalities in the active moiety of HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol that takes the cholesterol out of your blood vessels back into your uh, circulation, and that's the HDL to be. Um, there are elevated, and this is a genetic marker, of lipoprotein little a. This lipoprotein little a 
is also known as the deadly cholesterol. So we know of bad cholesterol, LDL. We know of good cholesterol, HDL. And we also know about this LP little a or deadly cholesterol. High LP little a is higher among South Asians and also Northern Europeans. The Scots, for example, also have a high risk of cardiovascular disease and they also have a high incidence of high LP little a levels. Then there are other things like uh, inflammatory markers, metabolic abnormalities such as homocysteinemia and diabetes metabolic syndrome, and abnormalities in the uh, LDL profiles. And I will just go over that very briefly with you. And this is actually from the Interheart trial. Go ahead. Well, actually, there are two, the question is, a, uh, what is the role of uh, uh, South Asians having smaller ca- uh, coronary arteries? And the, when we started this program uh, five years ago, as a cardiologist, naive to this data and to the literature, from my experience in the cath lab, an interventional cardiologist, I was under the impression that South Asians had smaller coronary arteries. The fact is South Asians do not have any smaller coronary arteries than the general population for the you know, body size. So that actually is not a real, uh, it's not a real finding. The, the issue, though, brings up the, that when South Asian, a South Asian has coronary artery disease, they tend to have diffuse, diabetic-looking vessels, diffuse arteriosclerosis. Um, and then you get the impression that the, that the coronary arteries are smaller but that is not the case. Then the other question is, well, how about the consumption of trans fats? And that actually it is true. If you have, uh, ref- you know, if you are refrying and refrying on the same oil, as you refry in the oil, you're producing all kinds of toxins in that oil, you're producing trans fats, and then you're consum- consuming that. The, the fact is that the crispier the fried carbohydrate, the more trans fat there is. And in the American uh, baking industry, you know, if you want to make a nice, crisp, uh, a flaky uh, uh, crust, then actually that is where the trans fats and that, you know, Crisco and all those, veg- you know, so-called vegetable uh, shortenings were very rich in trans fats. The highest incidence of trans fat in our food supply is actually the stick margarine. Uh, and uh, I would advise you to stay away from vegetarian ghee, which is high in trans fats, and also uh, stick margarine. So I'm glad you're asking the uh, questions because that will give me an excuse not to finish in 40 minutes. But go ahead, last question, we'll continue. Why the ratio? The question is, what is this, why the abnormal LDL to HDL ratio? There could be a genetic component to that which we don't understand yet, or it also could be driven by diet. Uh, the diet being a high-carbohydrate, low-protein diet drives lower HDL and uh, higher triglycerides levels and higher insulin levels. So uh, those actually, that the diet may be driving that. And if it is genetically mediated, this is a beautiful example in which you can actually turn on and turn off the gene by your behavior. Um, so hopefully that sort of answers your question. Now, going uh, to the interheart trial, which is sort of the basis uh, of um, many of the uh, points that have been discussed so far, you can actually see the data here in red where South Asians tend to be at a disadvantage. Higher ApoB to ApoA1 uh, ratio, that is LDL to HDL ratio. Higher incidence of diabetes. But look, there is a lower incidence of hypertension. There is a lower incidence of uh, smoking there's actually a lower incidence of obesity uh, when you compare uh, South Asians to you know, South Asians. You can, sort of, I, you, know, you can just to go, great, to go to Great America and you can see how obese uh, Americans tend to be. Um, now, the negatives, behavioral ones, there is actually decreased inc- uh, uh, activity, decreased physical activity versus the general population. There is half of the consumption of fruits and vegetables. There is half or more than half, a third of the consumption of alcohol. And there is actually appears to be less stress than in the uh, general population. 
Now, we talked a, a little bit about emerging or non-conventional risk factors, things that are not usually measured at the doctor's office. And here we go to the red, and that is triglyceride levels tend to be actually, non-South Asians tend to have higher uh, triglycerides than, than South Asians. Uh, LDL doesn't seem to be a problem. There's no difference in the bad cholesterol between other populations and South Asians. Um, the HDL level, the good cholesterol level, seems not to be any different, statistically speaking, between other populations and South Asians. So what is going on? Well, we need to look a little uh, deeper, and you can see that the level of the HDL to be the good, protective HDL cholesterol, that 92% of South Asians tend to have abnormal HDL to be, versus in this study population, 76% had abnormal uh, HDL uh, to be. The presence of lipoprotein little a, it tends to be higher among South Asians than non-South Asians, and homocysteinemia, representative of poor vegetable intake, actually is uh, twice um, uh, higher in South Asians than uh, non-South Asians. So in summary, we can say that there's not an LDL problem, but there appears to be a reverse cholesterol transport problem. There tends to be an issue with glucose metabolism and increased risk of diabetes. And there tends to be a genetically mediated higher level of lipoprotein little a. This is actually an autosomal dominant uh, condition. We all have high, uh, LP little a, but the high levels of LP little a are genetically uh, mediated. So these are actually our drivers of recommendation. These are the things that we looked at. We look at problems of the HDL cholesterol. We look at problems of LP little a. We look at abnormalities of glucose and insulin metabolism. We're looking at inflammation, and we also look at disorders of LDL cholesterol. And on that basis, we then give lifestyle recommendations and suggestions to discuss with the physician regarding our pharmacotherapy. And this is actually how we approach the laboratory findings uh, in the participants that come through the South Asian Heart Center. Not included here is our interview, and that is we do a complete lifestyle health assessment, family history, and we do some biometrics looking at your abdominal waist, your height, your weight, and your blood pressure. So let's just sort of talk about how to sort of live longer. And I'm not going to mention much about tobacco here. I'm just going to show you the real reason why dinosaurs became extinct. Um, the, um, the fact is that if you smoke and you have a family history of coronary artery disease, you decrease your longevity by 15 years. So if you want to live 15 years less than your peers and you have a family history of heart disease, the best thing to do is to start smoking. And that will guarantee you that you won't get your Social Security money back. <laughs> now, let's talk a little bit about successful aging. And um, what do we mean by successful aging? And successful aging is actually really important because if you're alive or are dead, well, you, when you die, you don't really, well, I think some people, most people don't feel it, or we think that we don't feel it, but the issue here is do we want to be successful ager? Because a successful ager, number one, has to be alive. Number two, has to be self-sufficient and independent. And one of the things that the, hu the human um, cherishes the most is self-sufficiency and autonomy. When you lose your autonomy here at work, or at home, or in the nursing home, that tends to be a source of great suffering and great stress to the individual. So in order to maintain self-sufficiency and autonomy, it is actually a good, it actually that is what defines successful aging. So actually this study was done here in Northern California in Alameda County. And they looked at 7,000 individuals and they followed them for 25 years. So it's sort of interesting, the investigators had to be young so that they could sort of take the 25-year the, the, the course of the study and be able to write the paper at the end, which was written in the 1980s. So what they found was that there were seven factors that were associated with enhancement of longevity and were associated with successful aging. Those seven factors are adequate sleep, seven to eight hours per night, regular vigorous activity, maintaining recommended weight, no smoking, non or moderate alcohol consumption, eating breakfast daily, and eating meals regularly and not snacking. If you think about it, 
out of the seven, five of them have to do with your mouth. Now, if you are a 45-year-old person and you have three or fewer of these healthy habits, you're expected to live to the age of 67. This is in 1980. If you have four to five habits, you're expected to live to the age of 73. If you have six to seven of those habits, you're expected to live to the age of 78. Now, I told you about the 12-year mark where there's only 11-year difference, but if the question doesn't have the number 11, 12 years is a good guess. So there you are. That's an 11-year difference just by adding the seven regular um, routines to your life, to your uh, uh, daily living. This actually has been, this Alameda 7 has been replicated in multiple studies. Now, the question is, boy, I am at, you know, I am at this age now, I'm in middle life, is there any way to go back? Am I all done? Did I sort of like, uh, I screw it up and I cannot enhance my longevity? Well, actually, that question has been asked and has been answered and was published in 2007. Can we turn back the clock? So they look at a population of 16,000 subjects. They were representative of the American population. And they asked them, they questioned them about some four simple um, factors. The consumption of five or, or more fruits and vegetables per day, regular physical activity, not being obese, that is not, being, not having an OBMI greater than 30. If you have a BMI of 27, you're FAT, but you're not considered to be obese. And um, actually, I am FAT. And not uh, having a, a current, uh, not smoking currently. So unfortunately, in America, and this actually has been replicated, also replicated in Europe, only about 8.4, 8.5% of the population actually fulfills these four simple uh, markers or factors. So then actually what they did is they tried to change, they tried to convert the other individuals who actually were not following these sort of four simple factors. And they were able to convert 8.4%. So then what happened? Within four years, there was a 40% reduction in overall mortality in individuals who were able to incorporate, that is, they were able to stop smoking, not become obese, have uh, regular uh, daily exercise, and to eat fruits and vegetables. The, all those individuals who were able to do that, who were not doing that before, they enhanced their longevity by 40%, and their cardiovascular uh, 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 enhancement was about 35%. In fact, most of the benefit, there was a greater benefit in the onset of cancer um, than in, the, in cardiovascular uh, protection. Now, this is actually what Hippocrates said. He said, eating alone will not keep a man well. He must also exercise. So we are now going to talk a little bit about the evidence behind the recommendations to exercise. You know, you go to the doctor's office, they always say you should exercise, you should eat fruits and, well, many times they don't even tell you to eat fruits and vegetables. But they, you know, the usual thing is you should have a well-balanced diet. So let's look at the data be behind exercise. So this actually was the first experiment that was done that demonstrated the health benefit of exercise or physical activity. And this actually, this double-decker bus was the site of the experiment. This was in the United Kingdom and it was published in 1953. It was published um, in the uh, Lancet. What they did is they looked at 31,000 London transport workers and they actually looked at the driver versus the conductor. So this is a perfect experiment. These individuals had more or less the same level of education, lived more or less in the same neighborhoods, and were more or less at the same age. One drove, and the other one collected the tickets going up and down that ladder that you cannot see over here. There's a stair here going up and down collecting. So what happened to them? In the, in the green here are the conductors. This is the incidence of coronary heart attacks versus the drivers they actually, by going, by just going up and down, they decreased the risk of a heart attack by more than, 50 more than 50%. Now, what happens to their longevity? That is, if they have a heart attack, do they tend to live uh, longer? Yes, they survive. The conductors 
had a 50% improvement in survival versus the drivers. This was one of the first studies demonstrating the health benefit, the longevity, the longevity benefit of being physically active. Now, this is actually in a different population. We're sort of dropping everything over here. Uh, next thing will be my pants, but uh, this is actually a study on 17,000 Harvard graduates, and they were studied for 16 years. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1986. Uh, there was also a follow-up study that was done in, also in Oakland uh, among the, the stevedores in the, uh, in the docks in Oakland when dock workers had to work really hard. And this is what they found. If a Harvard graduate exercised or walked three to eight miles per, uh, per week, he reduced or she reduced his chances of dying by 15%, only three to eight miles per week. One to two hours of light sport per week reduced the chances of dying by 24%. One to two hours of vigorous sport activity per week reduced the chances of dying by 35%. And the effect was most evident over the age of 60, such that if you are over the age of 70 and you burn 2,000 extra calories per week, you decrease your mortality by 49% right off the bat. If you actually burn 2,000 calories a week, you enhance your longevity by 51% uh, if you are over the age of 70. So the older you are, the more benefit you get from exercise. So when you're 20 years old, you're just practicing so that you can also do it at 70. Um, we have a question from the ARC. Is that for me? Yeah. Yeah, Go so ahead. Question, what, can you give us an example of a light sport and a vigorous sport? All right. So actually, a vigorous sport is playing squash. Um, a light sport is playing uh, double uh, table tennis. Okay. Uh, excuse me? Or golf. Check. Now, with golf, if you walk, you probably are walking uh, more than three miles, but uh, uh, there you go. If you run, yeah, you're just actually, you know, the only thing you're, you know, you're getting the social experience, which is really good. You're relaxing, hopefully. Some people have to go to see a therapist so that they don't get the jibbies. But uh, it can be, uh, it also, you get some sun, and, and actually sun exposure is actually, now we know that sun is good for you. Um, so there is actually some benefit uh, uh, to that. I have a friend who actually had to go to therapy for his jibbies. So um, the question then is, how about the weekend warrior? Well, the weekend warrior, that is someone who just exercises on the weekend, you know, the usual thing is, hi, hey, doc, yeah, I go up the pg and &E trail once a week. Um, they do benefit, um, but uh, they benefit if they're a low-risk individual. If they're a high-risk individual, then they don't benefit. In, in fact, they put themselves at risk when they're going up uh, and doing their sort of like weekend warrior activities. Now, how about changing? That is, if you are, you know, if you are not fit, what happens if you be, become fit? So this study was done in, in Texas at the, Cooper, um, at the Cooper Institute. What they found was they actually looked at uh, uh, 10,000 men, and they brought them in, and they exercised them on a Bruce protocol. And they separated them as fit, unfit, and unfit. And then they actually brought them back five years later, and they exercised again. And they actually found that the people who were fit on both testing actually had the lowest incidence of heart attacks. The people who were unfit at both testing had the highest incidence of heart attack, but that the individuals who actually were initially unfit and subsequently turned and became fit, they had a significant drop in their mortality rate. And in fact, from this data, they were able to calculate that per every one minute that you increase in your Bruce Protocol exercise stress test, you enhance your longevity by, by 8%. So if you actually can exercise a minute longer on a Bruce protocol, you are actually biologically 8% younger. And that's actually pretty impressive, pretty great benefit. In fact, the level of fitness is the most important predictor on how well you're going to live and how long you're going to live. You had a question? This is actually mainly for aerobic exercise. Now, the, the question is, they have looked at, they have looked at other things such as uh, 
which is a better exercise, aerobic exercise, weight training exercise, or stretching exercise, but not in this context. It has been done in the context of cognitive capacity and brain mass. With MRI, they have been able to sort of measure brain, brain growth. And of the three exercises, aerobic exercise is the only one associated with enhancement of your brain mass, and probably also uh, cognitive capacity. And I don't want to insult anyone here, but you know, it's a typical example is, is the bouncer, sort of you know, big, huge, bulky, dumb guy at the entrance of the bar. Um, and uh, then compared to the sort of like the bright sort of uh, marathon runner. Now, the next question is, if you're physically active, um, that is good, but can you actually inhibit the benefit from being physically active? And this study actually was done in India. And what they did actually, they separated people who were physically active, but also had different levels of sedentary activity. In this uh, study, sedentary activity was defined as sitting in front of a TV for three hours, which in the Silicon Valley would mean sitting in front of a computer monitor for three hours. And what you can see here is that being physically active and then sitting in front of a television monitor or computer monitor for three hours cuts in half the benefit of being physically active. You still have some great benefit. Here it is being physically active and not and spending less than 90 minutes in front of a, uh, of a TV set and you actually have a significant, almost 60% drop in cardiac events. Here is um, being sedentary and also, not, and, but, and also exercising. And you can see how you compare to non-exerciser and being sedentary. So there is actually, a, you can diminish by half being sedentary as well when you are also being physically active. So the game plan is, when you are sending an email, you send the email, you stand up, you go to the person you send the email to, and you tell them, hey, you know, I just sent you an email. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Just kind of related to that. Is, is the sedentary uh, analysis, is that linear? So, like, if every hour for five minutes you walked around, maybe got some water, you came back, does that change the impact? I, you know, this, this, this study, the question is, uh, how linear is this? Can you sort of uh, come up with a predict, you know, a sort of, can you put it into a mathematical formula? And the answer is, on the basis of this study, no. You just can't. You just can't. But could you do a study? Probably. Um, and you can sort of separate it further, but in this study, that was not done. Uh, but it does make sense. Uh, and in fact, uh, it, uh, it goes back to this issue about what do you mean by physical activity? And how is it that we should uh, prescribe physical activity? And this comes to this next slide. And item number one, which is sort of a little bit difficult to read, says home-based exercise is more effective than gym-based exercise uh, programs for greater exercise adherence and weight loss. That is, if your physician or whoever or your spouse recommends to you to be physically active at home or at work, versus someone gives you a recommendation to go to the gym, the individual who is receiving the recommendation will be more physically active and will lose more weight if he enters and gets a recommendation for a home-based or work-based exercise program. So you actually tend to exercise more and you tend to lose more weight. And the more important thing is that, you know, it's always, it's easier to lose weight than to keep it off. And actually individuals who are prescribed an exercise program uh, at home uh, or at work tend to actually be uh, better at keeping the weight off than if they're prescribed a gym-based uh, program. Um, and now this is also another thing, and that is what to do about uh, timing, timing of exercise. And there was a study that was just recently published. They put individuals on a high-fat, calorie-intensive diet, and they have three groups. Individuals who actually were under control here have nice, you know, Burger King, and uh, that's it. We'll follow how much weight you gain. Another group, they actually said, okay, here is your high-fat, uh, high-caloric diet. Let's take you to the gym. We'll have you exercise, but we'll give you some carbohydrates. You know, we'll sort of pump you up with Gatorade and sugar water and stuff like that while you exercise. And the other group, they had to exercise on an empty stomach. The fact then 
what they found was that individuals who exercised with an empty stomach did not gain any weight. Individuals who actually had no exercise in their study arm gained the most weight, but there was some weight gain of about 1.8 kilograms in individuals who actually went to exercise on a fed stomach. So if you're going to exercise, have a big glass of water and just you know, start you know, exercise on an empty stomach and then you have your meal. The other issue is about skipping breakfast. Remember one of the first slides looking at skipping breakfast and that is the longer you wait to eat after you wake up, you're higher the risk of gaining weight. So it appears that uh, exercise, tends, uh, actually that um, eating um, before um, uh, too long, not skipping breakfast is associated with a decrease um, uh, risk uh, of obesity. And then lastly, and uh, this is the issue about fish oils, the consumption of six grams of tuna oil is associated with a, an, an exercise program is associated with increased body mass as compared to safflower oil. So if you actually um, uh, want to take this into, into your life, then you can either have fish oil, so you can actually have, you can uh, have a salmon, you know, smoked salmon sandwich for breakfast. There is more fish oil in a salmon sandwich for breakfast than there is in any pill that you can buy at Costco. Go ahead. Is there any alternate source for that? Fish oil? Excellent. That's actually a very good question. And the question is, what is the, are there any non-vegetarian uh, vegetarian sources of fish oil? And there is. You can actually get algae, marine algae-based uh, uh, fish oil. Uh, you can buy it online. You can search for it. Um, it's available on Amazon.com. I'm sure you can Google it. Um, and uh, you can uh, ingest it uh, uh, that way. Or you can actually look at krill oil. Krill is a plantain, so this is, you, you need to decide if plantain is animal or vegetable, but uh, there you go. Now, this is, uh, we're running out of time, but, you know, I just told you that exercise is associated with enhanced longevity. Well, it affects your genes. This is actually telomere length. Telomeres are at the end of chromosomes, and they actually are, they mark the adoptosis of the cell. As long as you have long telomeres, that cell will, die, will continue to live and replicate. As the telomeres get clipped, um, as you are not able to uh, maintain the telomeres, uh, the telomerase uh, becomes inactive, your telomeres become smaller, and then you become older. And you can then, and that's sort of, it's sort of the program death of many organisms. Um, you look at uh, telomere length on heavy exercise versus a uh, uh, little exercise, and you can see that these individuals tend to have longer telomeres. The same can be said about uh, stress. In stress, individuals tend to have shorter telomeres than non-stressed individuals. And lastly here about exercise, if you actually um, want to maintain your cognitive capacity, there's nothing worse than you know, being demented. Physical activity, these are self-reported um, these are individuals who are no, cognitively normal at the age of 65 and who reported being physically active three times per week versus less than, uh, less than three times per week. And this is the onset of dementia. And there was a 38% decreased risk in dementia in people who were physically active three or more times per week. So there's, there you go. Not only do you live longer, but and you, you, know, you can keep your marbles and you know where they are. Any questions regarding this? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, if I look at my, both my parents, uh, mother's and uh, father's side, my grandparents mm -hmm. never went to the gym. Yeah. Never even lost their teeth. Yes. Um, uh, so, and diet is pretty normal, aside from maybe calorie, calorie restriction. I don't think they were doing anything special, right? Yeah, sure. Um, yet they all lived to the 90s. Yes. Right? And my dad had a heart attack at like 55 years old. Yes. And I'm, I'm just wondering what is changing over the well, you can think of me, you know, you can think of Mitsubishi, meaning that is um, your, your ancestors used to walk. They used to walk, work for their food. They had probably a lower carbohydrate, more made, possibly more dairy-based, vegetable-based diet. 
um, uh, they were actually maybe eating less, you know, fewer samosas. Um, and uh, there may be a lower level of stress. Um, and, you know, here we go again about that, you know, or behavior, and particularly with these abnormalities of diabetes, uh, HDL to LDL ratios, they actually tend to be um, genetic, but they can be turned on and off by your behavior, by what you eat, how you live, how much you sleep, um, your extended uh, family, uh, the support of your family. Um, and that, you know, is an important, uh, those are very important factors. The incidence of coronary artery disease in India has changed. And in, in presently in India, there's a big epidemic of coronary artery disease that wasn't there before. And, uh, you know, India is the best place to be a busy car interventional cardiologist. I mean, it's just in and out, in and out, you know. Uh, those hospitals are extremely busy. They account for 60% of heart disease in the world. So you can imagine. Go ahead. Uh, any other questions regarding this? Go ahead. Uh, yes. Yes. No. So we actually have developed a protocol for coronary calcium scoring. And you have to be, for a male, you have to be over 40, and you have to have at least one clinical significant clinical, uh, clinical factor for us to recommend a calcium scoring. For a woman, we recommend that over 45. Because over 45, the age bearing, you know, that is, you know, thinking about having a baby significantly and the chances of getting pregnant significantly go down. We are worried about the use of radiation. So we are selecting uh, individuals because there is some radiation exposure and there is no real safe um, amount of radiation. In the old days, we had an Imitron and we could do a, a electron beam tomography, which we use less radiation than going to the dentist to get some dental x-rays. But unfortunately, a big company bought them and took them out of business so they could sell their expensive 64 slide scanners. So we don't have that available uh, at this time. Now, there's another question, and the question is about vitamin D. And we talk about going out to play golf and being out in the sun. Vitamin D is sort of an interesting thing because those of us who have been around for the vitamin E story, we thought that everything could be treated with vitamin E and multiple people took multiple vitamin E doses and there were multiple initial studies showing how great it was and subsequently a multiple sort of meta-analysis of the data, the consumption of vitamin E in a pill form is of no benefit to anything. And in fact, if you're taking cholesterol-lowering medications such as niacin and statin, the consumption of vitamin E and vitamin C cuts in half the benefit and the reduction of arteriosclerosis and the reduction in cardiovascular events provided by the pharmacotherapy. So taking antioxidants and vitamin E in a pill form is not recommended in individuals who are taking uh, niacin and a statin. And in fact, they probably should not be recommended to anyone. Now, the story about vitamin D is sort of interesting because we know that people who have vitamin D levels over 30 tend to have fewer problems than people who have vitamin, levels, vitamin D levels below 30. So there is lower incidence of heart disease, hypertension, multiple sclerosis, and almost anything that we look at it tends to be lower in people who have higher vitamin D levels versus those who have lower vitamin Ds. The question is, is it the vitamin D or is the behavior that leads to higher vitamin D? Because those studies, those prospective studies have not been done. And that is, if you're outside playing tennis, jogging, gardening on the weekend, having some nice, you know, great healthy diet that is dairy containing, um, then you have higher vitamin D levels. If you're eating junk food, sitting at home, watching TV, playing video games, or in a cubicle all day long, not taking any sun exposure, you will have lower vitamin Ds, and also you will have a higher incidence of bad things happening to you. So we don't know. However, if you have vitamin D levels below 10, you actually, that's the number that is associated with increased risk of rickets. And we have had cases described in the pediatric literature of children with rickets in New York City from playing video games, which is more or less like sitting in front of my computer. So if you have vitamin D levels below 15, it is definitely recommended that you take a vitamin D supplement and that you get to, you know, to meet the, the, the sun. Um, if you have levels of vitamin D of 29, the um, uh, 
presently the Institute of Medicine suggests no therapy. But now commonly out in the population, anyone with a vitamin D level below 30 is recommended a vitamin D supplement. Now, I have found in my practice that South Asians tend to have lower vitamin Ds than my other patients. And most of the time that I see a vitamin D level below 10 is usually on South Asians. And there is actually, in this valley, there are mainly three reasons. One is the fact that as your skin gets darker, the more sun exposure you need. So it's recommended that in the tropics, the individuals get any, indiv you know, any individual get 15 minutes of sun exposure per day. In this area here, in this latitude, it's recommended that be doubled to 20 to 30 minutes per day. But if you are dark skinned, you need to have more sun exposure. But in this population where most of the South Asians are engineers or people who are working in places like this, unless you're playing out volleyball outside during your lunch hour, there is actually less sun exposure. And then you see, you know, you see this problem. And it's also that the vegetarian diet, the ideal vegetarian diet should be a dairy, a non-fat dairy-based vegetarian diet, high in fantastic protein, minerals, and if it is actually non-fat, because milk consumption throughout humanity's age has always been non-fat until recently when we learned how to bang the fat into the milk and sell it as homogenized full-fat you know, full milk. Actually, that is actually a very, very good diet. It's a full, complete protein, and uh, it tastes really good. Any other questions? One last question. I'm just curious, your risk stratification based on factors? Yes. Like the heart yes. Is it a craving factor? Type of heart disease? Yeah, this, the question, this is actually a very good question, and that is, there, bef before we came up with this, and when I went to medical school, and when any, any student goes to a medical school in any place in the world, they teach them about the Framingham risk factor formula where you can actually look at the habits of the individual, the tobacco, hypertension, HDL cholesterol, presence or absence of diabetes, and you can calculate what is the 10-year risk of having a heart attack. Low risk, below 10%, intermediate between 10 and 20, and greater than 20. When you look at cer certain populations and you apply this formula to Japanese, where the incident, or Chinese, for that matter, where the incidence of coronary artery disease is lower, the Framingham formula will overestimate the risk of coronary artery disease events. When you apply that formula to South Asians, we will underestimate. So we have you know, done a couple of things. We actually will either add one factor and we'll take the LDL and subtract 30 and then use the formula, or we have not used the formula at all. And what we have elected to do at the South Asian Heart Center is not to try to predict what your 10-year risk is. We just number the number of risk factors. The more risk factors you are, you have, the higher your risk. And the, the, the fewer risk factors you have, you lower the risk. And that's how we have decided to proceed rather than to give you a number, which in fact is actually not... When you look at the NCP um, ATP3 recommendations that incorporate the uh, Framingham uh, factors, they actually failed to sort of predict those who are going to be having heart attacks in almost 60% of the cases. So we tend not to use that uh, formula uh, at the South Asian Heart Center. Last, uh, over there, in the back. You know, I can't, I can't hear you, but there's a microphone right here. So, um, by the way, um, if you cannot find a way to exercise, you should get a dog. Dog owners tend to actually exercise more than not dog owners. It's a Canadian study. Um, now the question is, what breed? Well, this study did not incorporate the breed, but I have been an owner of a terrier. And terriers make your life miserable until you take them for a walk. So I would recommend you buy a terrier. The smaller the terrier, the better. They are the, have the highest nuisance level. Um, and <laughs> they bark like a baby, you know, a crying baby. And then you will enhance your capacity to exercise. Go ahead. Yeah, so I guess I'll just I'll summarize my question. Do you think doctors in the Bay Area in general are aware of the fact that uh, South Asians are at greater risk of uh, heart diseases, 
and should we be paying more attention regarding what kind of uh, which physicians do we choose for that uh, the question is how about the knowledge in the population how about the knowledge in the medical population and there goes the phone again um, the mission of the South Asian Heart Center is not only to bring awareness among South Asians, but also to educate the, uh, the, the physicians. And as a result of that, we actually have done uh, yearly uh, continued medical education uh, seminars to educate physicians of the increased risk of cardiovascular disease among the population. If you ask me uh, overall, uh, what is the knowledge base of the physicians in the Bay Area? I think that he has significantly improved over the last five years. Most cardiologists are aware of this because they see it. You see it in, there's, you, don't, you never forget to see to, when you meet a 34 year old engineer with a spouse and two kids in their waiting room with a heart attack. That's unforgettable. And then having to go and tell them what's going on. So cardiologists know about it. Now they may not know what the underlying factors are, and we are actually trying to sort of bring this up to their attention, these non-conventional risk factors. Um, but that there is an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, that, that is actually uh, relatively well known among the cardiology specialists. Among others, but then uh, not so much. This actually started at El Camino Hospital because a gynecologist who was delivering a lot of babies, a South Asian gynecologist, and um, you know, many, you know, she was seeing that the husbands of their, her, her young patients were having cardiovascular disease. And they, she brought this up to her attention, and this was actually the origin of the South Asian Heart Center. Go ahead. So the question, you know, the question is actually, how about supplements and cardiovascular disease? How about supplements and longevity? Um, there is no data showing that supplements will enhance your longevity or will decrease your risk of cardiovascular disease. If you think of fish oils as a supplement, there have been actually a few trials, the GC trial, for example, showing that the consumption of omega-3s um, in individuals who have had a heart attack of about 850 milligrams of omega-3s per day significantly decreases the uh, recurrence of cardiovascular events. But if you look at changing the diet and if you look at individuals who are prescribed a Mediterranean type diet versus a conventional American Heart Association recommended diet, those individuals will have a 53% drop in their risk of cardiovascular disease just by incorporating a Mediterranean diet. So I would pay less attention to uh, over-the-counter home remedies, and I would pay more attention to what is in front of your plate, in front of you as you sit uh, uh, at the table, and your physical activity. You know, we actually have run out of time. You know, this is like, uh, it's taking us a long time. You're welcome to stay here, but the next part of the talk was about diet and the importance of fruit and vegetables, and then also about stress reduction. So I'm just going to give you a summary. I'm not going to show you many slides about, any slides about that, or maybe I will at the end, but what to do. Nutritionally speaking, you actually, it is recommended that you have two cups of fresh, freshly cooked vegetables per day. So who walks around with a cup? Nobody knows what a cup is for the most part, but everybody has a fist. So you look at your fist, and you're supposed to have two fists of vegetables per day. Now, a vegetable is not a fruit. A vegetable is a vegetable. Because when you ask people, how, what, uh, what, how many vegetables do you eat? You say, oh, doc, I eat a banana every day. That's not a vegetable. That's a fruit. Okay, so it's important about that. So two cups of vegetables per day. That will decrease your risk of stroke by 24% right off the bat. Okay? Now, how about fruit? A cup and a half of fruit will actually have a significant benefit in your uh, longevity and blood pressure. Okay, so it's two cups of vegetables, a cup and a half of fruit per day. Oily fish twice a week if you are not vegetarian. Otherwise, then you can actually have the omega-3s in another form or not have them. And then lastly, you should have 
12 knots per day. So we're talking about tree knots. Now, they say, how about macadamia knots? Well, macadamias do not grow in a tree. They grow in a palm. So that's not a tree knot. So, and they're very high in saturated fat. So the recommendation would be 12 knots per day, a cup and a half of fresh fruit per day, not from a can, and two cups of cooked, freshly prepared vegetables per day. Exercise 10,000 steps per day, because 10,000 steps is almost three miles per day. You multiply that by seven, that's 21 miles per day. Because your body, your, your um, physiology, even though we'll know if you're a sprinter or a marathon runner, you can go to the Olympics and see the body of the sprinter versus the body of the marathon runner. The physiology will adapt to that kind of behavior. But regarding your cholesterol and your blood pressure and all that, your body cares about amount, not intensity. So 21 miles of physical activity per day, just you know, park really far away and walk into your office, uh, ride the bike or walk to the next building next, you know, two blocks away, uh, go up and down the stairs, they all add up. Uh, and you will have uh, benefit from that. And then lastly, this issue about stress and stress reduction. In the interheart trial, there was actually the incidence of heart attack in these young individuals. Uh, stress, psychosocial tr stress accounted for about 28% for the increased risk of cardiovascular events. And the issue is what is stress? Well, most of the time, stress is when you have a deadline, that is, you have no control. So the loss of autonomy is very stressful and self-sufficiency. But stress is defined in this, in this context as that which actually stress results from the inability of the physiology to maintain a steady state or homeostasis. And I'm sure you all study biology and you know what homeostasis is, it's a steady state. And psychological stress results from the lack of creativity to actually uh, uh, address a challenge. So if there's a challenge and you know the way out of it, if you know the answer, it's not stressful. If you, lack, if you have the creativity, it's a joy, not stressful. If you lack that creativity, if you lack the cognitive capacity, if you lack the intelligence or the education, you then accumulate psychosocial stress that way, and then you experience this. We actually don't have enough time to go over this, but there is a lot of beautiful data looking at a form of yoga called transcendental meditation, which is, in fact, associated with decreased psychosocial and... Uh, physiologic stress, and it's associated in high-risk people with coronary artery disease with a 43% reduction in heart attacks, uh, uh, stroke, and mortality in a recent study that was presented to the American Heart Association. So anyhow, this is sort of like the gist of the talk. You have a question? I have too many questions, so I'll hold back. Instead, I will ask, how do we follow up with you after this talk to ask you our questions? Well, it's actually the best way to do it um, is you go back to your uh, computer and you are going to southasianheartcenter.org. And then there you can register for the South Asian Heart Center. Um, you can f uh, make an appointment online. You can actually have an, app an appointment to go through the 250 uh, question questionnaire that we ask. Uh, then we, you, we bring you into the South Asian Heart Center. We some, do some biometric measurements. You get this comprehensive test that usually costs about $1,000, and you get it for $73. Then you have a chance to, you will be talking to a health educator, a, uh, a clinical educator. Uh, you will be talking to an exercise physiologist, and you'll be talking to a yoga teacher. That's all part of the program. And then after that, if you are found to have multiple risk factors, all this free of charge to you, you will be assigned a heart health coach who will be going, so it will relieve your spouse from nagging, and this heart health coach um, will be helping you um, to sort of fulfill the recommendations of nutritional recommendations, stress reduction recommendations, and exercise uh, recommendations. So uh, this is actually how you do it. And um, if you have any questions after that, then you can also ask the, the health educator and She'll give me a call, send me an email, and I will sort of respond to your question. So actually, the, another thing is that back there, in that corner, Pia has actually our brochures, if you want to pick one of our brochures and, uh, 
I give you all this information on how to, how to reach us and how to enroll in the South Asian Heart Center. Go ahead. question is, um, do you count legumes? you count the dal? Well, you, the problem with the dal is that if you take a quarter cup of dal, that makes soup for four people. <laughs> but you're only having a quarter cup of dal being distributed among four people. Uh, so that is actually why it does count some, but it actually doesn't count for all. Um, and um, now someone asked a question about uh, supplements. And this issue about fenugreek and other spices. In Ayurveda, which is the national medicine of India, um, there are actually routines that are prescribed for the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. The, one of the main texts of Ayurveda is actually is, uh, written by Charak. And Charak was actually the first ophthalmologist. And uh, it's known as Charak Samhita. And in his text, he says that eating... Uh, vegetables that grow from the vine is associated with improvement in cardiovascular health. So what are those vegetables that grow from the vine and how then do we marry um, science to this uh, Chirac Samhita? Well, we didn't have a chance to go over the diet part, but if you invite us, we'll come back and we'll talk about that. Um, it is recommended that you have 25 grams a day, at least 25 grams a day, of soluble fiber. So where do you find soluble fiber in vegetables? Well, soluble fiber is found in vegetables that grow in the vine, such as eggplant grows in the vine, uh, okra grows in the vine, uh, squashes, they grow in a vine. You want to push it further and think about uh, the wine country, the fruits, grapes, actually are also on, you know, wine, red wine, and uh, it's associated with increased cardiovascular health. So you actually will find in those texts uh, information that then you can actually marry with the science. And this is actually as part of our a mission statement that Ashish read at the beginning. We are actually, the South Asian Heart Center is determined to address this epidemic of cardiovascular disease using a culturally appropriate lifestyle recommendations. And we actually, you can think of this as providing evidence-based Ayurvedic medicine, recommending lifestyle, which is the cornerstone of Ayurveda, how you exercise, how you eat. In Ayurveda, with the appropriate diet, you don't need the medication because food is, just like Hippocrates, food is actually medicine. Uh, any, other, uh, any other questions? Well, thanks for coming, and I hope to see you at the South Asian Heart Center.